Steve Bradshaw. And this is my search for the Deadly 60. That's not animals that are dangerous to me. Yes, it is! But animals that are deadly in their own world. <laughs> the wildest animals, the weirdest places. <laughs> and for the first time, we're finding out the challenges they face. Oh, no, look at this! And what we can do to save them. <laughs> and you're coming with me every step of the way! <laughs> this is Borneo, a giant jungle island in Southeast Asia. So many of the plants and the animals that occur here aren't found anywhere else on the planet. They're totally unique. But these jungles are in big trouble. My mission here is to find out why. This time on Deadly 60, we've come to Borneo, the third largest island in the world. This is the Kinabatangan River in northeastern Borneo. It is a big, broad, brown highway through the forest and one of the best places in all of Borneo to see jungle wildlife. I've been coming here for over 20 years and it's a place close to my heart. The jungle is stuffed full of some of the weirdest, the most wonderful and the most deadly animals in the world. And there's new species being discovered all the time. Before we see what they're up against, I want to show you some of these animals up close. And there's no better time to start than the dead of night. Going out looking for wildlife at night like this has many advantages. First of all, the torchlight just focuses your attention. It cuts out all of the noise and all the distractions around it. And you're just looking where the torch is pointing. Then you pick up shapes and colors that you might not otherwise see and eye shine. The reflection of your torchlight's back of the eyes of nocturnal animals. The only problem is the species I'm looking for tonight doesn't have strong eye shine. And it's the master of disguise, the world's longest snake, the reticulated python. Growing to nine meters in length, the reticulated python is a deadly ambush predator with an appetite to match its size. Almost everything runs the risk of being swallowed whole by this giant of the jungle. I've got Rich here behind me, and he knows the snakes of these riverbanks better than anyone, so if he can't find one, no one can. No pressure, Rich. <laughs> Rich is studying the pythons here to find out how the changing forests are affecting their survival. These snakes hide in the vegetation on the riverbank, so that's where we're concentrating our search. There's something on the bank right in front of us. Oh. It's not the python I'm looking for, but it is another deadly predator that lives here on the river. That's one of my fav favorite sounds in all of nature. It's the contact call of a young saltwater crocodile. So those sounds carry over a really good distance, and essentially it's a call out to mum to come to its aid. What a glorious little creature. Handling it like this isn't going to do it any harm. But I'm not going to hold on any longer than I need to in case mum's on her way. It's amazing to think that an animal like this could grow up to be the largest reptile on the planet. The biggest saltwater crocodiles can be six meters in length and weigh up to a ton. There's 60 to 80 cone-shaped teeth inside that mouth, and those will break and be replaced continuously throughout its life. They're a little spiky trap for catching little fish and for catching things like little frogs, perhaps even freshwater snails. What a gorgeous little animal. There is no doubt that this is the home of giants. Not this one, though. This one's just kind of cute. It might be endearing, but it's not the giant I'm after. We need to keep searching. There's plenty of wildlife around. Oh. Whoa! <laughs> And we soon spot something in the undergrowth. Oh, it just got up to my knees in mud. Oh, that is stinking. 
we go. Yay! Well done, well done. Oh, that's a great snake. Ah, and how are we supposed to get back to the boat? <laughs> ah, I just got to swim. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is the glamour end of the job. Whoa. I've caught some snakes in some thoroughly weird places in my time. This is the first time I've done it in a mud bath. And uh, I'm not getting in the river to clean myself off because it's full of crocodiles. <laughs> but that's a decent sized snake and really strong as well. That's amazing. Being covered in mud, it's not the easiest to handle. <laughs> <laughs> this one has a, a wonderful luster to the skin. It's, it's what you classically expect from a reticulated python. It kind of looks like it's been dipped in oil. But behind its beauty is a very effective and deadly skill. What it's doing right now is throwing cores of its body around my neck. And I can ma maybe keep this on for probably a couple of seconds more, because what it's doing is how it will take on its prey, constriction. And constriction is fascinating. I mean, a lot of people think that essentially what it's doing is choking the air out of its prey, but it's far, far more than that. These snakes are so strong, with as many as 800 bones, each of which fix muscles that can drive the whole body like this around my throat. And it can literally squeeze and squash all of the internal organs. And now I'm gonna need some help. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. So this snake, you know, is probably shy of three meters long. And you can see how a snake like this could overpower you pretty quickly. And certainly smaller prey just would not stand a chance. It is muddy, slithery, super strong. And the reticulated python is on the deadly 60. And now I am gonna go and have a bath. The longest snake on the planet with the ability to squeeze the life from its victims and eat prey bigger than its own head. The reticulated python is definitely deadly. Along the river, the rainforest looks untouched. But you don't have to go far to be confronted with the challenges facing our crocs and pythons. There's a temptation to think that forest is just forest. But that couldn't be further from the truth. There's lots and lots of different kinds. Rainforests like this are absolutely bursting with life. There's so much living here. But here in Borneo, sadly, the forest is making way for endless plantations that go on pretty much over the entire island. In the last 30 years, Borneo's forests have changed dramatically. The jungle has been cut down and replaced by one particular crop oil palm. It's alarming how little forest there actually is close to the river. It's only a couple of hundred meters back from the water. And then you just hit this, this huge expanse of oil palm or palm oil plantations. And, you know, it still looks green. It still looks like life. But in terms of what's actually living there, this is night and day. What you've got here is what's known as monoculture. Mono means single, and monoculture is where you have just one plant being grown in an area. And because you have just this one plant here, as opposed to the thousands of different plants that you have in the forest, there's very little life. In Borneo alone, palm oil plantations now cover an area larger than Scotland. And it's all because of what grows on these trees. This is the fruit of the oil palm. And it's one of the most important plants and fruits on the planet because it's incredibly oily. If you can see that on my fingers, just about everything you can possibly imagine comes out of that little humble nut. The brightly colored oil palm fruits are harvested all year round. 
collected by huge trucks. They're transported to large factories around the world to be processed. So when you squeeze down the palm fruit and the nut kernel inside, this is what you get. This is actual palm oil. And it looks kind of like any other vegetable oil. It's runny and yellow. It doesn't look massively appetizing, but this is used in just about everything. To get a sense of some of the stuff that you find palm oil in, I got all of my crew to go through their kit and see what they've got. And everything's got palm oil in it. So we've got biscuits. Go down through the ingredients and yeah, palm oil. We've got chocolate. All the chocolate's got palm oil in it. We've got shampoo. It's got shampoo, it's got palm oil in it. Toothpaste has palm oil in it. And this is the problem. To supply the world with all the oil it needs to make these different products requires more plantations to grow the fruit. And that's leading to more and more of the jungle being cut down. As the forest goes, it's not leaving any space for wildlife. To find out more about some of the animals that are most affected, I've come to a conservation centre in the north of the country. As the forests of Borneo are swept away to make way for the plantations, so many of the wild animals that used to call those jungles home all of a sudden are left without a place to go. Many of them are rescued, including these Borneo sun bears. They might look cuddly, but you wouldn't want a hug from this bear. With large 10 centimeter claws, they rip open termite mounds with ease and climb even the tallest trees to feast on their favorite foods. Right now what it's doing is rolling back its upper lip and lifting its nose, and that's classically to engage its sense of smell. Bears have the best sense of smell of any mammal, and some of them can smell food from many miles away. That just lifting its nose and just... In the wild, male sun bears need an area of jungle the size of almost 2,000 football fields to find enough food to survive, spending as much time up in the trees as they do on the forest floor. Oh. <laughs> well, that was close. <laughs> that was some serious bear gymnastics. Oh, gone. <laughs> <laughs> just looking down like, what? I worked really hard for that. She's not going to give up on dinner that easily. Just at the end of this branch is one single piece of fruit just hanging there. And you can see her just kind of trying to reel it in. Go on. Go on, girl. You can do it. As skilled and adaptable as these sun bears are, as the forests disappear, so does their home and all their favorite foods. And it's not just their problem. Other species are also at risk. Of all the animals facing extinction here in Borneo, there's one whose story really stands out. First of all, because it's the best loved and best known of all the animals here. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, because it's one of our closest relatives. It's the orangutan. Seven times stronger than a human, and with a two-meter arm span to swing through the forest, the orangutan is Asia's only great ape. But right now, they're struggling to survive. We've already lost over half the Borneo orangutan population in the last 60 years. If deforestation continues, rescuing babies like this one and nursing them back to health will be their only chance. Because orangutan are so closely related to us, it's very possible for us to transmit our diseases to them. So while I'm close to these animals, I'm going to be wearing protective gloves and a mask as well. So any pathogens I might have can't be passed on to these very valuable and vulnerable animals. I'm meeting two baby orangutans, both rescued when their mothers were killed on plantations. 
These two youngsters are four and three years old. Here, they'll be looked after, with keepers teaching them the skills their mother would have done. Seeing them being led by the hand like that is exactly how I lead my baby son around. The name Orang Hutan in Malay means person of the forest. And this is such a well adapted animal to living in the treetops. This is the world's largest arboreal mammal, that is, tree living mammal. The males can be absolutely huge and yet still be utterly at home up in the treetops. Although their red orange fur looks to us to be quite obvious, if you put them into an environment that is quite dark and shaded and you get reflections off the trees and through the leaves, actually they blend in really, really well and silhouetted up against the sky like this, they can pretty much disappear. Watching these two tussle together, it's so playful. So much like a pair of human siblings, brother and sister, battling away, just scrapping with each other. And all of a sudden, the second you see the problem here through their eyes, that's when it starts to become real. The fact that we could lose not only these ancient forests, but the animals that live in them for the sake of one single product is to me one of the great catastrophes of the modern world. But palm oil isn't something we can just stop using altogether. It's complicated. Farmers need to grow it to provide an income for their families. And as a product, it's super efficient. Growing other oils like sunflower or coconut would need 10 times more forest to be cut down. But there are other options we can produce palm oil sustainably in a way that doesn't cause this destruction. I'm going to see for myself how being more sustainable is already having a beneficial effect. I would love to be able to stop deforestation tomorrow and completely replant Borneo with trees, but that's not going to happen. There is, however, a way to do palm oil in a way that doesn't make it possible for things to live there. Being here on the Kinabatangan, there is a very narrow strip of forest alongside the river, and that's enough for animals to move up and down. It's a perfect wildlife corridor. Imagine if you could do the same inside the palm oil plantations. Effectively, having lines, corridors of trees in amongst the palm oil, that could be enough for things like orangutans to survive. In addition to corridors, plantations can be sustainable by providing habitats for animals on a much smaller scale. The main enemy of wildlife is too much tidiness. So having an area that's completely empty of vegetation, obviously nothing can live there. But inside the plantations, if you don't tidy up too much, then eventually little habitats start forming. So where these old palm fronds fall, the woody parts of these can lie there for years, not breaking down. And underneath all of that can become a really good home for frogs and lizards. And then as the trees themselves start to decompose and fall over, eventually you form little caves and caverns underneath. Under this oil palm tree, snake expert Rich is protecting a deadly favorite that's taken up residence. Well, that is not something you see every day. It's a female reticulated python and she's on her eggs. Unfortunately, there are a few here which look like they're kind of old and dried up, but underneath her are the eggs that she's protecting. So this is a palm oil tree that 
that's fallen down. And where the roots have come up, they've left a sort of alcove, a hollow. And this little place in here has formed a perfect habitat for our reticulated python to look after her eggs. It just goes to show that wildlife corridors and a little bit of mess can help nature find a way to survive. Deadly. With potential solutions available, I want to show you just why I care so deeply about protecting these forests. And the best way to do that is from the very top of the trees themselves. So it's not possible to just monkey climb up the tree. Instead, what we're going to have to do is use the world's greatest ever catapult to get ropes up the tree. So I've got this, I've got a weighted shot bag, and if I can fire this over a decent sized branch, then I can use it to haul up the ropes. Let's give it a go. Shot one. Oh, massively undercooked it. That was rubbish. This uh, can be quite a long process. You may want to go and make yourself a cup of tea. I could be here a while. Shot two. Oh, just short. That was a good line, though. Good line. Just not quite getting enough welly. Shot three. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Oh! That was really close. Really close. But practice makes perfect. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Yes, come on! Go on! Absolute genius. Now, all we have to do is attach a bigger rope, and I head up there. With a bit more climbing kit, I'm ready to go. Right, I'll see you up above the clouds. It's always kind of tricky manoeuvring yourself around these dead branches because some of them can be very, very heavy, which would be super, super dangerous for anyone below. So I'm going careful. Oh, this is... Sunny. So we're now up into the canopy, which is kind of the business end of the rainforest. This is where the vast majority of the life is and where most of the leaves are to generate all the energy for the trees. So most of the trees get this far, but no further. Ours just keeps on going. At 40 metres tall, our tree sticks out above the rest of the jungle. It's what's known as an emergent. Now I've just got the last little bit to go. We're here, up above the treetops above the canopy and with the most sensational view. That way I can see all the way out to the river. In that direction, I can see mountain tops. This is literally the best place in the rainforest. Absolutely sensational. Having climbed this wonderful tree, I'm going to do something really special. I'm sleeping up here overnight. The sun's setting, beautiful colour to the sky. You just never see this when you're down below, completely surrounded by trees. And I can hear endless frogs, bugs, a few calls from the last few birds as they're getting ready to roost. Let's see if I can get some sleep. It's 
just starting to get light and there are amazing sounds just ringing through the forest. Lots of calls from birds starting up with their very first call of the morning and the bugs. But the nicest of all of them is the singing of the gibbons. It's just beautiful sound that just stretches over the top of the forest. It's like the most incredible orchestra ever. I felt like the king of the world up here tonight. Sounds like Mark the cameraman's coming up to join me. Morning, Mark. Room for one more? I hope you brought me some breakfast. <laughs> I've just bought a camera and what? a light. <laughs> How am I going to eat a camera? <laughs> It's the ultimate room with a view. The perfect panorama of a fabulous, fragile forest world. Every single one of these trees could be hundreds of years old and is a home, a habitat to so many different kinds of animals. Each one is precious and to lose any one of them seems like a tragedy, but here in Borneo, we're losing thousands every single day. If all of this was to disappear, it would be the greatest tragedy. But there are things we can do. I think palm oil is here to stay, but there are different ways of doing palm oil. It doesn't have to mean that every single bit of forest has to disappear. It doesn't have to mean that all the animals have to go. Just like with your back garden, if you want to make your garden friendly for wildlife, you leave some spots that are messy and wild. We have to do the same here in Borneo. If we don't, then animals like the orangutan have no chance. Join me next time for more Deadly 60. Holy moly! I was expecting a lot of sharks, but I wasn't expecting that many.